this became more and more controversial. And people started pointing out that, hey, if you're evaluating people for how they understand DEI, then what you're doing is you're evaluating people on their stances on certain controversial issues, or at least you create the opportunity to do that. I think that what people need to be thinking about right now is how to build new things within existing institutions. And one knock-on effect to this is that it might create the pathway for um, a, a new cohort or generation of scholars. Welcome to The Contrarian. I'm David Bernstein. In a world filled with noise, I'm here to provide the signal. and welcome to The Contrarian. I'm your host, David Bernstein. Today, we speak with John Saylor. John, I've been really interested and anxious to have you on. Um, I've been a big admirer of your work, and, of, and I don't think there's anybody who I could have talked to who knows more and has done more to sort of research the problem with DEI in universities. So I'm, I'm really interested in um, and highly anticipating this conversation. So appreciate you being with us. Great. Yeah, I am um, really glad to be here. All right. So maybe in broad strokes, could you describe the problem of DEI in universities? Yeah, a big question, but a good one. Really, since the 1970s, the concept of diversity has been something that universities have uh, um, embraced as a core ideal. And so uh, all the way back to the Bakke decision, uh, uh, racial preferences were justified, at least by some people, not as a... Um, tool for uh, rectifying past injustices, but on the basis of the educational benefits of diversity, saying that different perspectives are important for learning and different racial and ethnic backgrounds can be a sort of proxy for uh, diverse perspectives. And uh, ergo, you know, racial diversity is something important and something that universities should try to foster and put money behind and put uh, uh, create sort of a bureaucratic infrastructure to advance. And now that has been a longstanding goal and there's been longstanding infrastructure in universities since really that time to try to, to, um, to advance this ideal. What has happened, especially over the last 15 years, but really it's been a long time coming, is that that ideal has taken on a, a, a life of its own. And to some extent, it has been infused with a kind of idiosyncratic ideology, uh, which means that the, the diversity bureaucracy today that goes under the, the titles diversity, equity, and inclusion often function in a way that uh, establishes a particular orthodoxy and is able to um, enforce that orthodoxy through various tools that, um, you know, uh, uh, administrators are able to use. So to give a concrete example, a, a lot of my reporting over the last couple of years has been on the way that these ideals have become a, an important component of faculty hiring, which is really, really important because obviously the, the faculty at a university, that, that's really the heart of the university. That the, if you're able to decide who is on faculty, you're able to shape the, the research mission, the teaching mission, basically every aspect of the university. Increasingly, universities have required uh, uh, university faculty to discuss their commitment to this ideal of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now, um, if diversity, equity, and inclusion simply means treating everyone uh, with respect or making sure that uh, you're not being discriminatory, then that seems perfectly reasonable. But like I said, over the last you know 15 or 20 years, these concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion have been infused with, uh, uh, you know, ideological connotations that make very um, um, strong claims about the nature of things like oppression, about the nature of race relations in the United States, to some extent about the uh, 
the, the, the very nature of the United States, about the meaning of merit in equality. And so what you see in just that example uh, of mandatory diversity statements, you see uh, um, you know, this, this ideal of diversity, this ideal of DEI being used to really enforce uh, an orthodoxy and an enforce it at a key inflection point in um, the life of the university, namely in, in faculty hiring. Uh, and you know, that's not the only issue by any means, but that that's a good example of the problem uh, uh, in general that I've tried to 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 write about over over the last couple of years. Yeah. So you've um, you you've spent a lot of time looking at DEI statements in particular in various versions of DEI statements. One of them was at my alma mater, Ohio State University, <clears throat> which has become one of the more surprisingly ideologically charged campuses around the United States. Um, to what degree are DEI statements still being used at Ohio State and elsewhere? And to what degree do they, are they really the core of the problem? The DEI statements have been used in faculty hiring uh, at least since 2010 at some universities. So it started in the University of California system. And it's worth noting up front that this was very explicitly um, uh, uh, designed as a tool to bypass uh, uh, certain um, you know, non-discrimination laws. So California has um, uh, Prop 209, which is uh, basically a stronger non-discrimination law than even the Civil Rights Act, which, which makes it very clear that consideration of race and hiring is not allowed. And the University of California system uh, was, as a whole, not very happy about that. And they tried to develop certain tools to basically um, um, change the the makeup, uh, the demographic makeup of the faculty without necessarily using race as a factor. And so what they did was they said, well, if we can't consider race, maybe instead we can consider people's contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can say what really, what we should really look at is, um, you know, the way this, it's articulated this way, how um, you understand diversity, equity, and inclusion, your past contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and your future plans for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, um, you know, it started in the UC system. And uh, um, by, you know, 2015, 2018, it was more widely used in part because of, um, you know, a, a federal grant program put on by the National Science Foundation, which served as sort of a, a best practices program for other universities. It's called ADVANCE. So a lot of universities uh, uh, received this grant and, um, um, you know, they began creating advanced offices and a, a best practice was to use um, DEI statements in faculty hiring. Uh, and around 2018, this became more and more controversial and people started pointing out that, hey, if you're evaluating people for how they understand DEI, um, and if DEI entails all of these big prop or uh, uh, all of these um, propositions and assumptions about controversial issues, then what you're doing is you're evaluating people on their stances on certain controversial issues, or at least you create the opportunity to do that. Um, and so over the last couple of years, there's been uh, um, not just pushback on, on paper, you know, there hasn't just been pushback uh, on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, there's been pushback uh, uh, through legislation and through university policy. So, um, you know, you brought up Ohio State. One of the places where there's been a lot of pushback is in Ohio and at Ohio State. And there's good reason for that. Uh, just to give, you know, to, to, to sum up that little story, um, for the last three years since 2020, and it's, you know, it, it's notable that this began around 2020, uh, every search committee at Ohio State was required to um, create a rather extensive diversity faculty recruitment report uh, detailing all of the ways that they, uh, the, the search committee uh, evaluated candidates' contributions to DEI. And that gives you a that gave us a pretty good look at, um, you know, whether or not these critiques about the, the, the ideological content of these requirements, it gave us a pretty good look at uh, whether or not that was true. And we found in a lot, what I found in a lot of instances is that was true. 
um, and pe uh, people were being clearly rewarded or punished on the basis of, you know, uh, uh, beliefs that are obviously very clearly contestable, very clearly something that ought to be debated and, uh, um, you know, certainly shouldn't be a requirement for uh, a, a faculty job. And so to, to answer your question about whether they're still used now, Ohio State uh, uh, has said that they no longer use diversity statements. Um, and a couple of other universities, specifically in response to this kind of reporting, have said, have voluntarily said, we're not going to do this anymore. And I think that that reflects a pretty widespread sentiment in, uh, throughout academia uh, 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 um, in, that's at least skeptical of this practice in particular. You know, DEI in general is still. I would say, uh, uh, pretty pretty widely supported in academia. But these kinds of requirements, these specific requirements, uh, according to one FIRE survey, about half of university professors said they think that this is a political litmus test. So there's been pushback on, um, you know, at the university level to some extent, and there's been pushback via legislation. But at the same time, that's almost all in places where there is some uh, likelihood of a political response in the first place. So basically, you know, to put it bluntly, red states. Uh, uh, for, to, for the most part, in states that don't have any uh, um, serious political opposition to uh, this kind of uh, identi identity-driven progressive politics, um, the, the practice is still very much alive and well. And if you look at what's happening, say, in the University of California system, uh, you see that uh, it, there's a long way to go before um, things are really reformed. Mm. So we talk a lot about uh, these sort of bloated DEI bureaucracies. And my understanding is University of Michigan has a $30 million annual budget. Um, and it's uh, interesting because the University Board of Trustees, I believe, recently issued some statement that dedicating itself to the free exchange of ideas. And yet it continues to have these growing uh, DEI budgets. I'm quite. I'm. I'm curious. Do we know how how big DEI departments are in various universities? I know there's like more than four thousand institutions of higher learning in the United States, so it'd be difficult to do that with all four thousand. But like, could do you know what the top two, three hundred universities, the size of the DEI bureaucracies? You know, there was a Heritage Foundation study on this a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, um, and so like the average of 45 or something like that in major universities. But that was still, that was like 2020, I think. Yeah, so there's that that somewhat outdated uh, Heritage Foundation study. I mean, these things really do, uh, uh, to, to that point, rapidly change. So yeah. um, it, 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 as I've put it before, 2020 was in some ways a, the, the Cambrian explosion of DEI policies. And a lot yeah. of what happened was universities made commitments to establishing yes. uh, more bureaucracy, more policies, and um, they only made good on those commitments a couple of years later. So whereas, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, the, the momentum for just an unbridled, identity-focused social justice movement, the, the, the fervor has decreased a little bit. But I think the bureaucratic commitment has not necessarily decreased. And in some places, it seems like it has increased. Another person to pay attention to on this is uh, Mark Perry from uh, the American Enterprise Institute, who is also a professor um, emeritus at uh, the University of Michigan. He's documented this at a number of universities and produces these long lists. You know, it's it's kind of remarkable just to look at the spreadsheet of all of the people at uh, major universities like University of Michigan or Ohio State and see how many people and just their base salaries. Uh, and it's a, it's a lot of money. And I and I think that um, you know, despite some pushback in in at a lot of state universities, that that really isn't hasn't changed considerably. Even in states that have passed these um, laws uh, ostensibly ending the, their university DEI bureaucracy, you see that um, uh, what seems to be happening, at least at some of these universities like UT Austin, is more of a reshuffling rather than saying, actually, the, the underlying service that you're providing, we think is uh, antithetical to the university. So we're not going to have you do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. 
Um, you know, I've I've noticed that the DEI programs at universities describe themselves differently. So I've gone online, for example. Okay, what does it actually say at Ohio State? What language do they use? Then I look at another university, and I've seen some differentiation in that. Some you can tell that they're explicitly ideological, like oppressed oppressor. And others, it seems like it's a litany of sort of programs promoting representation and and the like. And it's hard to know based on how they describe themselves, whether they're they're practicing this very ideological uh, form of, of DEI. What is your take on that? Yeah. So, I mean, to be clear, it's not my contention that every instance of you know, a university DEI office is going to include a group of people who wake up every day and say, how can I make sure that everyone thinks the same way about race and gender or anything like that? I mean, that's a caricature that doesn't even happen in the more ideological cases. But, um, you know, it, it, it is fair to say that uh, um, when you look at what actually happens in a lot of DEI trainings, when you look at what happens in a lot of these bureaucracies, um, uh, I would say a, a lot of it is um, uh, 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 just sort of rote bureaucratic work um, that is somewhat uncontroversial. And, um, you know, when when making the case, uh, when, when discussing, you know, what's going on at universities, I think it's, it's good to point out that um, uh, a lot of these requirements even, they, they end up being, um, it, 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 it kind of seems like they're, um, more an instance of uh, 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 kind of banal rule following rather than uh, uh, what some people characterize it as like just rote ideological enforcement all the way down. So to give an example, you know, it, it is fair to say that a lot of these trainings include explicit endorsement of controversial ideas. That, so you can go to medical schools, schools of public health, uh, uh, places where you would think there's not going to be any sort of ideological stance that the, the the school or the faculty is trying to push. You can find, um, you know, DEI uh, trainings and seminars on critical race theory or on the myth of meritocracy or on, um, you you know, any any number of sort of controversial uh, subjects and implicitly often these trainings endorse these controversial ideas without necessarily a lot of discussion. I mean, really, um, you know, a, a, a training is not an appropriate place for this to even where, right. where this where this kind of stuff should even come up a training. Right. We train in Microsoft Excel. We train mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, how to um, how to supervise people more effectively. We don't train people in ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By definition, a training is sort of just infusing uh, uh, instructions. And ironically, um, uh, uh, one of the one of the key figures in um, very progressive, uh, even uh, you know, s sort of Marxist education philosophy, Paulo Ferrer, um, he has a he he discusses this concept of the banking model of education, where where education is sort of this this thing that you have, you can just uh, like like um, putting money in a bank account. If you're educating something, you're, 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 you're just sort of giving them this, this product. And he, I think rightly kind of critiques that, that understanding of education as merely, um, you know, funneling knowledge into someone. But at the same time, a lot of these trainings seem to do exactly, seem to intend right. to do exactly that. We have the right answers about the, the number of topics that are, that are heavily disputed across, you know, our country, and we're just going to give you the answers, and uh, it doesn't. It, it, it's not set up to succeed as a model for civic discourse. And I bring all of that up to say, actually, it's it's fair to say that a lot of the time that's what happens. But actually, a lot of the time, what happens is you get a a somewhat banal discussion about what you should and shouldn't do while hiring university faculty, mm -hmm. or you get a, a relatively, um, you know, uh, a, a relatively unguided discussion of d real disparities that exist, and and that's all that's there. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to say that like every instance of a mandatory diversity statement being required and being looked at by a search committee means that somebody is going to be 
um, um, you know, weeded out for their political views, or that when you have a training, that it's necessarily going to be an instance where uh, uh, somebody wants to uh, instill the right ideas and has no um, no desire to to for a give and take. But I think structurally, you almost always create the opportunity for that when you have this kind of bureaucracy and these kind of policies in place. And I think that gets to the heart of the issue. And that's why um, you, you see more and more people saying that like this bureaucracy in itself is a problem and, and we would rather it just not exist at all. You, you see people like Barry Weiss yeah. saying end DEI. And I think the reason, and, and you know, that's, that's certainly my position. And I think the reason for that is not because we think that in every instance you have uh, this massive violation of academic freedom, but it, it's sort of an, an invitation. It's almost like the concept creep is built right into the concept. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'm advising an organization, a uh, group of people right now who are opposing the DEI program in their institute. They wrote a statement um, and, a, and a resolution critiquing the DEI program of their, of their organization. It was very straightforward, very blunt uh, critique. And then I asked them for the DEI policy that the organization was was promulgating, and I looked at it, and there was a lot about representation and making sure that we're, there's there's equity. It doesn't say that there has to be an exact proportional representation in the leadership ranks, but you get the sense that that's what it aspires for. But even if you put that aside, um, you can see that there are placeholders in the policy for what could be very ideological instruction and indoctrination and the like. It doesn't say so explicitly. So it's explicit about the representational goals, but implicit about the ideological goals. So if you oppose it, like those people did, you, you're opposing the representation because that's the only thing it's explicit about. And then you're open to critique that that's all you care about. You're just trying to keep minorities from getting good jobs or getting better representation. And um, I don't know how, or even if you can separate the, it, it's like a package deal that you're asked to sign on to where one, one, one aspect of it is very explicit. One aspect of it is implicit. And you don't know if the implicit stuff is actually going to be implemented, but you're, but you're asked to sort of um, take on blind faith that it won't be implemented, that it is just about representation. Yeah. You know, it, it's worth going back to that example of the UC system. I think that um, when this policy got started in the University of California system, you can probably take everyone at their word that really what they were trying to do was just make it so um, they were, they were hiring, hiring a higher proportion of uh, minority uh, uh, scientists and scholars. And they thought, one way we can do this is by looking at their their background. And, and they, you know, um, they even probably, or actually not probably, you know, you, you, you saw, you could see a lot of instances where they emphasize things that, um, maybe are not really what you should prioritize in faculty hiring, but that they're at least non-ideological. So I don't think that it makes that much sense when you're hiring a scientist to put, you know, a, a ton of weight on whether or not you've mentored people of a certain background. I think that, you know, that, 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 um, you know, it's not like a, a problematic thing to bring up in the hiring process, but to give it outsized weight, it, it seems like a, a, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a, 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 a wrong priority, but at the same time, you know, what you gradually saw with the UC system over the, the 2010s was moving from, um, just talking about representation to, uh, developing tools for evaluating faculty that were explicitly ideological. So by the time you know 2017 uh, comes around, UC Berkeley did something really remarkable. So first, they initiated what's called a cluster hire, where they hired multiple faculty at once, um, and they made DEI a major component of that hire. And what, so what they did is they got 800 faculty applicants, and in the first round, the only thing they looked at was diversity statements. And they cut the, the pool from 800 to 200 on diversity statements alone. I mean, that's a massive statement of priority saying that this is the most important thing, or at least such an important thing that it should really be a, a hard litmus test. But if you look at how UC Berkeley evaluated their candidates, it becomes even more remarkable because they, they developed this rubric for evaluating DEI. Um, 
that describes what kinds of statements get you what kinds of scores. And two things really stand out. So a faculty candidate can get a low score if they say, and this is a direct quote, that they, they prefer to uh, uh, ignore the varying backgrounds of their students and treat everyone the same. So if you, if you basically articulate the ideal of colorblind equality, you want to treat your students the same and really uh, you, you at least aspire to um, not, not treat students as you know, primarily members of, of particular racial groups, but instead look at them as individuals, which is it, frankly the way a lot of people might uh, articulate their commitment to diversity, that gets you a low score. At the same time, another thing that gets uh, that that earns you a low score, according to the Berkeley rubric, is um, saying that uh, expressing skepticism about racial affinity groups because it keeps everyone uh, keeps certain groups separated from one another. Um, you know, racial affinity groups are incredibly controversial for good reason. They are literally segregated groups endorsed by an institution. But here you have a, a, a tool for evaluating scientists, scholars at, in the country's you know, most prestigious state university system saying uh, uh, this, this tool <clears throat> basically endorsing the idea that if you express skepticism about that, you should get a low score on this very consequential evaluation. Um, so, you know, you, what, what I think that that tells us is that uh, often there is the I, uh, um, people within institutions express the ideal of increasing representation, but when they look for tools to to actually do that, sometimes uh, you know the tools available for uh, uh, to a lot of these institutions um, end up pushing them towards uh, uh, these basic violations of of the the norms of liberality, and I think that's what you almost always get when. When you translate those those goals into actions, it's easy enough to say we want to increase representation. It's pretty hard to actually do that. And often when people try to do that and feel this this imperative that they must do that as an institution of higher education, they end up only having certain tools at their disposal that 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 violate their other more core principles. Mm. Yeah, so. You had mentioned Barry Weiss's argument that it must be banned. Um, there's a counter argument by people who are critics of DEI. Um, I thought David Brooks did a good job of that in a column that he wrote for the New York Times. He cited Ibu Patel, who's a Muslim interfaith leader, who said, look, um, we're not going to be able to ban DEI. In other words, it's too well entrenched in the system. So let's start to move toward uh, sort of a paradigm shift. Um, he he called for hiring like chief cooperation officers at universities. Uh, another example of this um, was in a Washington Post piece uh, written by Danielle Allen, who is an African American political philosopher at Harvard. She she cites the actual her actual experience trying to get an alternative, more inclusive, more pluralistic DEI program through Harvard that would include both viewpoint diversity and religious diversity, which would at least in theory, negate some of the more ideological aspects of coercive DEI. And, you know, of course, that got caught up in process after George Floyd and never went anywhere. But but at least in theory, one can imagine, and there are, we, are, we know pluralistic DEI is out there. There are people who practice it. Um, it could exist. Do we have to actually um, push for the banning of DEI or can we push for the reform of it? Yeah, so I think that at this point, you we're, we kind of move away from a conversation about just principles, and we have to start talking about what's practical. Um, I think that it makes the most sense to, uh, I, I, I mean, first, recognize that universities uh, have a massive administrative bloat problem to begin with, and uh, we, we need far fewer administrators than we have. Uh, and it's sort of a disgrace that we hire more and more administrators while the the uh, you know tuition rates are are skyrocketing. It 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 betrays you know maybe even a deeper problem in higher education in general that that we're able to uh, devote so much uh, money and attention to um, something that might actually subvert the core mission of the university. So um, I would say you know in instances where 
it's possible to just uh, fully roll back that bureaucracy. That's what I'm in favor of doing. And I think that um, I think that that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do and, and, and perhaps just the best option. But if you're if a lot of people who I talk to are not in institutions where that's necessarily feasible, I don't think that that's going to happen at Harvard anytime soon. So, uh, you know, if if creating an institutional counterweight is the best thing that we're going to get, uh, the, the next best thing that we're going to get, then I think that it makes a lot of sense to create institutional structures that, that sort of mirror what's what's happened. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily again i think that when you have a university sponsored training that should be on a topic that is appropriate to train people in and not on a topic that really is uh uh you know belongs in the classroom rather than in a in a training seminar where somebody's trying to to just instill information so i don't necessarily think that like free speech trainings are the way to go but i do think that um, university level positions devoted to academic freedom, uh, university academic freedom committees that have serious um, uh, uh, decision making ability that, that can shape policies. I think that that's an enormously good next step. And to the extent that you know not everyone is is quite at the you know at the place where I am, where they've <laughs> been fully convinced, perhaps because they've read way too much about this, that that there are huge problems that probably can't be rectified by anything other than just a full sale ban. If there are other people who are in other institutions who are who who just recognize that, hey, we've got some problems. I think that absolutely you should be trying to invest in those kinds of alternatives. Yeah, you may end up with sort of a red state versus blue state uh, approach where, okay, strategies in red states where you can, like Oklahoma and Texas and Florida, where you can ban it, you go ahead and do it. And in blue states where that's not politically feasible, you end up trying to reform it the best you can and see where you end up. And maybe through some combination of interventions, you end up with a, a movement away from course of DEI. Does mm -hmm. that sound right to you? Yeah, and I'm I'm um, curious to see how things are going to play out in the state of Utah, which of course is still a red state. But it, it's worth noting that three years ago, uh, Utah's now governor Spencer Cox was all in on DEI. He put his his staff through a, one of these 21 day equity challenges that included right. readings in Ibram Kendi. Uh, um, he he signed a DEI compact. He hired a, a cabinet level diversity officer. Uh, recently, he's pretty much reversed course in a lot of ways. And I think he's reversed course. He's pretty explicitly said because he's read the arguments of people like Yasha Monk, Ibu Patel. I think he might have even read my article about what's going on in Utah uh, in the uh, in uh, Deseret News because he in in a press conference he kind of repeated some of the arguments that I made. Um, you know what he did was he said this is a problem we need to solve it. But the the Utah State Legislature did say that what they want to do is create um, uh, something of a race neutral alternative to to what DEI offices are doing. And now that does leave some of the infrastructure intact. And maybe uh, functionally, that's going to that's going to allow for the same problems to persist. But I do think that that gives a model for some states uh, where where legislators who do not consider themselves conservative can come in and say, hey, look, uh, uh, you know, this allows us to maintain the ideal that everyone it can be included, but um, it moves away from explicitly uh, I, uh, kind of identity focused uh, uh, rhetoric and at least the endorsement of this this strong, um, you know, the, the implicit endorsement of a, a, a strong identitarian uh, focus in higher education. And I, I, I think that it's possible that we'll see that. And again, you, it's also worth noting that you can you can disaggregate these issues. Um, I do think that uh, by way of either university leaders or the courts, we're going to see a big change over time uh, on the issue of diversity statements because I haven't brought this up yet, but it, there, there are also serious constitutional issues mm -hmm. when you evaluate people on um, their political beliefs. You know, the First Amendment has uh, uh, strong protections against viewpoint discrimination uh, when it comes to government hiring. And that's exactly 
what you yes. know state universities are doing. And so there's a there's a case to be made that this just like anti-communist loyalty oaths in the mid 20th century were deemed illegal by the Supreme Court. Um, functional oaths to a certain vision of social justice could very well be deemed illegal in uh, you know across the country by uh, by way of the courts. But there are I, I guess all of this to say there are other routes for some. Um, for reformers to to take that's not just a wholesale mm. ban. Yeah, and it seems to me that the correct me if I'm wrong, the the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action at higher education also sort of established the principle that that the protected category is not black or BIPOC people, it's it's actually race itself. So um it, with that in mind, lawyers now have tools to oppose discriminatory DEI practices such as affinity groups that they might not have before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have yet to see exactly how that's going to play out. And of course, right. um, you know, when you're talking about faculty hiring, the, the the Civil Rights Act already, you know, basically prevented what was going on in admissions um, a little bit more clearly. But yeah, I, I I think that there are going to be increasing legal tools for addressing some of these issues. Yeah. So. Putting aside DEI, obviously there are other structural problems in higher education today. You had meant, um, you know, we have these institutional structures uh, um, and that we might look for institutional structures within universities that sort of move in the opposite direction and provide some open inquiry. One that I'm starting to see um, is sort of in, uh, centers for civic thought in various universities. Um, I know University of North Carolina, Yale Law School, and others have established these. I think the goal is, of course, once you establish those as those norms and and you hire really great faculty and it attracts really great students, over time those centers for civic thought will eclipse many of the grievance studies programs and others that are promulgating the ideology. What do you think about that? Overall, I'm really excited about that, and mm -hmm. um, you know, North Carolina is a good example. The uh, faculty at UNC were pretty upset when the Board of Trustees established this new School of Civic Life and Leadership. That's a good sign. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it very well could be. Um, but but if you read the 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 articulated mission of that school, which is going to, you know, at, at least initially hire something like 20 to 25 new faculty members at, at UNC, um, you know, the, the mission is basically to uh, establish a, a, a place where uh, um, the ideals of free and open inquiry are kind of at the heart of the education that students are going to get. And now I think that that uh, uh, is, is hard on principle to actually oppose. And if it's done right, what we'll get is a, um, a, a state university that uh, residents of North Carolina, like myself, can send their children to, adopts the ideals that a lot of people have been calling for for a long time and that a lot of people have been saying that universities have massively overlooked. And I think that that is pretty much the most promising thing that we could possibly do. I think that what people need to be thinking about right now is how to build a new, not just uh, new institutions outright like the University of Austin, but build new things within existing universities, yes, within agreed. existing institutions. And one knock on effect to this is that it might create the pathway for um, a, a new cohort or generation of scholars who um, see their scholarship as as uh, a, a, in the spirit of classic classical liberal learning rather than in the spirit of you know, political goals. Right now, if you are a, um, if you see yourself as a scholar activist, there are a lot of universities around the country who will give you a, a basically a boost for that. They will, you will get favor in the hiring process for saying that my scholarship is really, you know, a form of activism, even though that that really subverts the the basic ideal of, of liberal learning, where you are pursuing the truth so intensely that you will um, pursue it regardless of the, uh, you know, necessarily any given outcome. I mean, everyone, when they're in academia, everyone who um, uh, is involved in academia, it's not like they, they're they indifferent to um, what the effects of their their research or teaching might be. But the ideal of liberal learning is that, the, that you know, universities are the only institution that exists 
explicitly devoted to the rigorous, intense pursuit of truth that we hold as an ideal and a good in and of itself, um, you know, that's something that if you articulate and if that's really your driving ideal, it's actually very difficult right now to get a faculty position. I mean, the faculty job market is dismal. Um, yeah. you know, but let me let me ask you about that. Um, you know, it's OK. So we we've all seen the surveys and the polls and that about university faculty. I mean, they're overwhelmingly um, progressive in attitude. Um, you know, I, uh, Steven Pinker used the, the, said that there's only something like 3% of the Harvard faculty that c- deems themselves conservative. Um, and it might even be t- declining, you know, especially in the humanities and social sciences and so forth. You know, one, what, you know, it seems to me that it's going to take a monumental effort to try to shift that. And, and I'm, my question to you is, do we need viewpoint affirmative action? Yeah. You know, I, I, I I have talked to some people in the higher ed reform space who basically think uh, that I should lay off these arguments about viewpoint discrimination because what we need is not um, a reassertion that viewpoint discrimination is bad. What we need is the right kind of viewpoint discrimination. Um, And so like some conservatives will say, what we really want to do is actually just hire more conservative professors. And I think that, um, you know, in in pursuing a, I, I think that academia would be a lot healthier if there was a greater balance of political perspectives on campus. But I don't think that the way to achieve that is to, to hire on the, on the basis of viewpoint. That said, I think it's perfectly legitimate to do what a lot of universities are doing uh, right now, kind of in the opposite direction. A lot of universities are engaged in hiring programs where they say, what we're going to do is hire university faculty members who are um, engaged in research on topics of social justice and equity. And now that's not quite the same as viewpoint discrimination. Nobody's going to challenge that in court because it's legal to do. You can say that if you have scholarly expertise in these topics, um, and if this is how you view your scholarship, uh, 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 then then that's who we're going to prioritize. I think that that is a bad priority, but it is not illegal and it's not in principle bad. It's I think it's bad because that's definitely not what a university needs right now. Uh, almost no university needs to have more faculty members who are committed to basically doing scholarship that will land them squarely, uh, uh, you know, far to the left of center. Um, I think you can do something similar to that and say, we are we, we recognize as a university, maybe UNC can say this, that we are lacking in um, people who have um, you know, more or less this vision, this clear vision for the, for liberal learning that involves a, a basic commitment to truth, that involves a basic commitment to um, free expression. You can you you can prioritize hiring in that way. And I think that there are ways to do that that do not violate you know the law or don't violate the principle you know the principles of academic freedom that I think are you know should not just be seen as a tool to uh, uh, for the outsiders to 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 get a wedge into the institution it, they, but they should be treated as you know really fundamental to the university's survival um, and but but I do think that that involve that has to involve a kind of multi generational capacity building project that 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 it needs to extend beyond the university. We need more uh, uh, donors to look at promising postdoctoral fellowships. We need more institution, but para-academic institutions uh, at universities that help undergraduates uh, kind of navigate uh, acquiring a liberal, uh, a, a liberal education in places where that might be actually difficult to do. So like at Columbia and a couple of other Ivy League universities, there are, um, you know, study centers devoted to liberal learning that are not a part of the university, but they 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 kind of per- fill in the gap a little bit by um, providing a, a different perspective. And I think that over time we can create a pipeline. Uh, the the only way that I think long term we're going to fix this is create a pipeline of people who are committed to that classical vision of the university and uh, encourage them to go into academia and build institutions where they can go to uh, uh, and and do so in a way that that doesn't violate those core principles that are important for the flourishing of the university. Yeah. So we still have this problem even in that more promising scenario that I hope comes about, and I would certainly push hard for it, 
um, <clears throat> that there are these entrenched grievance, grievance studies programs and the like that still may be dominant. And um, the question I have is, is there a, a remedy for that? I'm, I'm thinking of some kind of audit of, you know, what if you created some kind of structure where you audited professors, not for what they think, they can express their opinions. That's what academic freedom allows, but also allows students to question them that, that where, where an academic or uh, must provide multiple points of view about a, about a topic. If so, they're not engaging in sound pedagogy. Um, can, you know, it, we, when we talk about academic freedom, a lot of times we're just, we're just talking about the rights of professors to teach and say what they want. What we don't do is talk about the academic freedom, if that's the right term for students. I mean, is there a student's bill of rights that's, that says, I have the right to hear multiple points of view on various subjects, and I'm not getting that at, at this university? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's a thorny issue. And if you look at organizations, say like PEN America, um, their conception of academic freedom basically takes one component and amplifies it far out of proportion, I think. You know, there's a group of people within academia who say uh, that academic, academic freedom basically just means institutional autonomy and faculty governance. And so they say if, uh, you know, a state or a university state, appointed university trustees try to get too involved um, what what they're going what they're doing is they're violating faculty members own ability to govern themselves and that is you know it on its own a violation of academic freedom and I think that this actually gets gets the 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 role of faculty governance wrong now faculty governance is really important for academic freedom because, it is the university faculty who are going to best know how their disciplines uh, operate and uh, thus are best, most capable of making um, sort of a lot of uh, decisions about how they should prioritize what research gets uh, funded or what areas of specialization they hire in and, and you know, which ones don't or how they should decide on um, what what subjects are really important to, te to teach and what aren't. Um, and so it makes sense to say that, well, uh, uh, you know, a, a state legislature might not know really how what kind of decisions are, are best. And so um, faculty governance is sort of a, a tool that you can use to say, no, we're not going to, we're, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically these outside interventions are likely going to lead to um, individual uh, uh, censorship of, of faculty members or basically subvert the ideal way of governance. And I think generally speaking, that's true. But what we have right now is an instance where, um, you know, the, the violations are coming from within. Uh, and so the question, getting back to your question, that it's the, there, there's sort of a question of what do you do about that? Um, and I would say, you know, this is an, an enormously thorny issue, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I think it's legitimate to say that if a university faculty is enormously far afield of these ideals that, um, uh, you know, a lot of people see as the core ideal of a university, it, it, you know, I don't think that these faculty governance arguments hold up. And I absolutely think that asserting things like the right of students to have, you know, ultimately a, a liberal education trump the right of faculty to, um, you know, continue to, to just operate without any accountability whatsoever. And so I think like it, it I, I think more people, more university leaders should be looking at the possibility that, hey, these departments are just antithetical to what we're trying to do. We're going mm -hmm. to phase them out. That has yeah. happened in the past. I don't think that that's inappropriate at all. At all, it right. can be done. They were, they were created through an act of politics. Why can't they mm -hmm. be ended through an act of politics? Which really brings me to the sort of and my final question. Um, you know, the, Barry Weiss hosted a debate recently between Chris Rufo and Yashka Monk. I thought it was very thoughtful and instructive. Um, and you know, I'm I'm find myself being torn uh, on on it in a way. Um, there's things that Chris Rufo advocates or or is is supposedly advocating like divisive, banning divisive concepts. In the debate with, with Yashka Monk, he very clearly said, look, this is legislation. People in um, various 
authors into the legislative process. So I may not like everything that's in the legislation. And I think he was referring to the divisive concept stuff, banning divisive concepts. But I understand I'm, I'm a political realist. And I, I sometimes worry that people like us who want a liberal education aren't willing to sort of get down and dirty in politics because we know that politics is illiberal itself in many ways. It's about power and the use of power never is a scalpel. It's always a sledgehammer. And, and I'm wondering though, still, if we still, we need the sledgehammer. I mean, these are institutions and bureaucracies, you know, that, that are very stubborn. And if you end up with a a group of faculty that's incapable of self-policing should a you can can the governor of a state should a governor of a state say okay look you you faculty of the grievance study program X at university Y are incapable of making this change so I'm just going to get rid of your whole department and um, you know is that a bridge too far I guess I think the best thing that uh, you can do as a state legislature or governor is to try to find people who um, have legitimacy to uh, govern academic institutions and empower them as much as you can. So I think that uh, um, both prudentially and on principle, it's better for for somebody who is, um, you know, a a, a scholar by, uh, you know, by trade and uh, who who is involved in university who understands university life to to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, And so to the extent you can, that can absolutely be a goal. I think it's better to empower people more at the local level to do that. That's why I'm, um, you know, I pay very close attention to who who is selected as university leaders. Right now, UNC is picking a new chancellor. I'm watching that very closely because that's going to decide, you know, that's extremely consequential. I was very happy uh, when Ben Sass was picked as president of the yeah. University of Florida, because I, I think he has a good vision for that for that university. Um, yeah, I, I I do think that your point though about how we're always going to be working with blunt force instruments is is, is something that people should take take into account more, especially when you uh, try to account for just how bad things are. I mean, if we're yes. serious that that um, we have this massive institution that defines so much of our scientific inquiry, which is the you know the backbone of American innovation, that uh, is increasingly the the rite of passage into adulthood for all of our young people, or at least that's that's held up as the ideal rite of passage. If it's you know culturally the uh, an incredibly dominant institution, if we're saying if we're serious that this has gone way off the rails, if we're serious that it is now fundamentally in a struggle over its vision, a vision between pursuing certain political ends and pursuing what we say is its true end, the pursuit of truth, we're in a really bad place. And you have to be serious about what might, uh, you know, how that might change. And I right. think that, um, you know, I might not like the tactics of some people who are involved in reform, but I often find myself really liking the results. And I, right. I think that's like an important reminder. Like, yeah. if, if you like the results, maybe the tactics are, are, are needed sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of my liberal friends talking about this and I'm, you know, I guess a, a somewhat of a political liberal moderate myself, you know, we, we're, what we're doing is we're saying, we come up with a lot of excuses why those type of aggressive interventions are going to lead in a bad direction without comparing it to the bad direction we currently have, which is, which is, you know, a, a liberal, like, I think we're, we're, we're so scared that we might cross the line in our intervention and we will, by the way, or the people who do it well, because they're actual human beings with which might with their own, you know, flaws and political agendas and the like, that we actually are willing to leave in place something that might even be worse than what they replace it with. And and um, and so I think we should be willing to take some risks there, even though I might not always like the results. Um, John, this has been um, extremely incisive. I'm so glad we brought you on. I think you've thought about this as much as anybody, and you've been really doing amazing work, shedding light on the problems with DEI and DEI in universities especially. And um, I really look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. This has been a blast. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in to The Contrarian. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
Don't forget to rate our podcast on Apple and Spotify. Stay connected with us on social media for more updates. Until next time, keep challenging.